Hi and welcome to the Corin Barraclough Show. Coming up, I'll be talking to John Morgan, who runs Marcus Mission, which aims to reduce the risk of suicide for men aged over 18. I also had a chat with Scott Healy, who wrote to me about his personal 23-year experience of suicidal depression. But first, I've had a really interesting letter from a lady who has two generations of experience with the broken family law system. Her letter to me is very long and there were lots of identifiable details in it, so I've cut it back to make it legally safe. Dear Corinne, in the early 90s I knew a couple, let's call them Polly and Jack, they had two young children. After a fight, Polly kicked Jack out of the house. He left without drama and that's where the journey began. Polly used to leave the kids locked in the house alone while she went to the local RSL to meet men and bring them home. Then she moved to another state and Jack had trouble getting access to the kids. He asked me to be a reference for him to get regular access to his children. We spent so much time together that we fell in love, later married and had children together. Over the years, he had child welfare turn up several times with various accusations of child abuse, including him being accused of sexual abuse while bathing the girls. None of this happened. He was and has always been a wonderful father and stepfather. The actions of Polly have affected Jack, myself, eight children, his parents, his sister, his brother, five cousins, 19 people in total. Fast forward, we are now going through it all again with my son. My son was in a relationship on and off for about two years. He had finally had enough of her heavy drinking and lying and was ready to call it quits when she announced she was pregnant. He later found out that she had been using an ovulation kit in order to fall pregnant. Throughout the early stages of the pregnancy, she dangled the baby like a carrot to keep my son in a relationship with her knowing how much he wanted to be a dad. They moved in together when she was about seven months along. He knew the relationship wouldn't last as she was a compulsive liar, but wanted to create a solid bond with his child. Things all went okay for about three months after the baby was born, but down the track, my son couldn't take any more of this toxic relationship. She goes on to detail harassing texts that the ex was sending. The text started getting weird and accused him of being abusive, she says. He has never raised a hand to her or any other woman in his life and was confused about what she was talking about. Fast forward to August 2020 and he hasn't seen his little girl in almost seven months. He's appeared in court three times so far, costing him time off work and putting his job in jeopardy. He has two more appearances to come, that means more time off and it's told that the case is unlikely to be resolved until 2021. She says, my darling grandchild has missed out on all of these, she's talking about family occasions. Her cousins miss her dearly and struggle to understand why they can't see her anymore. I am her only living grandparent and she's missing out on the bond between us. My son has missed every milestone, first tooth sitting up, crawling and soon I suspect walking. He has been suffering with depression on and off and has sought help with that. I've even been put in the position of talking him out of suicide, something that no one should ever have to do. The pain of seeing my son heartbroken has also taken its toll on me. My relationship with my other grandkids and daughters-in-law has also changed as I have a constant fear that at any given time this could happen again to one of my other sons. My son's only crime was to no longer want to be with this toxic woman. And as a direct result of this, my sweet little grandchild has lost a string of people who care, all because of one woman's selfish, destructive actions. And the worst part is the Australian legal system allows it to happen. She has not submitted one single piece of evidence to support her claims. She gets free legal representation, cheap housing, child support, and the sole parent payments, plus a DV victim payment of $5,000. It's time to put both parents on an equal platform financially, emotionally and legally unless either parent has been charged with abuse. My son is going through this and not one charge has been laid. Thanks for taking the time to hear my voice. I hope things change soon so less families are torn apart by the current system that is biased and unfair to the children we are meant to protect. You see, when I say that broken family law issues aren't just a men's rights issue, this is exactly what I'm talking about. It affects children, it affects fathers, aunties, uncles, cousins and grandparents. It affects men and women. Look at all the people listed in this particular story. 
The bad news for fierce feminist ideologues is that they cannot keep a lid on all of this pain. It's affecting generations of women and they will not remain silent. Please keep your stories coming in. I'll keep telling them that's what I'm here for. Now into my first interview with John Morgan, who runs Marcus Mission, which raises awareness and aims to reduce the risk of suicide for men aged 18 and over. So my guest today is John Morgan, who's going to talk to us about Marcus Mission, which is all about raising awareness um, specifically around reducing the risk of suicide in men age 18 plus. And I understand that there's various things that the organisation is doing to try to tackle the problem. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to John and finding out some more. Thanks. Hi, how are you? Really well, thank you. Nice to Good. nice to see you. <laughs> yes, finally. It's never quite the same with messages, is it? <laughs> no, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> so, a little so, bit of background as to Marcus Mission. Please, yes, go for it. Yeah, sure. So, so we um, we lost our nephew to who died by suicide about six years ago, um, and he was living with us at the time, and I'd um, been a crisis counsellor for twenty years at that stage, and I guess we were reflecting back on, well, what did we miss? You know, what was absent for a 23-year-old that, um, in terms of support? And so one of the, the, when we started to do some research, a couple of things that we found. The first one is it's not just a mental health issue for men. In, in fact, in, in many, many cases, what we found through the research is a lot of the situational factors have a large bearing on, um, on the, the suicide ideation and ultimately um, a person that attempts. So things like what, divorce. What, and, kind of, what kind of situational factors? So yeah, so just, just uh, things like divorce, addiction, custody issues, long-term health issues, financial issues. And that was, that was our first sort of finding. So we needed to build a program around um, resilient skills for those sort of things. But the other thing that we, we found, Corin, was that, um, that um, men don't necessarily engage that well with a lot of the clinical support that's on offer. So, you know, for, for Marcus, he was sort of saying, why would I want to talk to um, a 65-year-old woman that doesn't have a clue about what I'm going through? Um, and yeah. he'd, he'd certainly gone through some of those situational factors which ultimately led to pretty chronic um, and, and long-term depression. But one of the things we decided to do was say, okay, how do we engage men in a different way in the community, in a more informal, non-judgmental, peer-based sort of setting? And so Marcus Mission was founded sort of maybe two and a half years ago um, with our trial program on the Gold Coast. And it had really three major components um, in this different approach to men. One, one of them was the classical suicide prevention training for communities that engage with men so that they could you know, recognise the singles and support signals and support men in doing that. But the two key platforms of the program were, one, going up upstream, if you like, to men that were facing those situational challenges at the time and equipping them with some resilience skills. So we ran a series of resilience building workshops. Um, the first one on know thyself, you know, about your thinking and how you can manage your, uh, the, your, your approach to distorted thinking and, and um, discomfort in feelings, uh, knowing others, so relationship skills and dealing with conflict, which is a key, key situational factor. And then finally, optimism and well-being. So getting, getting the men to be a bit more focused on future. So. The workshops were very different. So in a sense that we'd, we'd talk about a couple of concepts and then the guys would grab a footy or a frisbee or whatever and go out and have a chat in pairs or small groups and do some work that way. And so we, we refined that over a period of time, but we also at the same time were bringing through men that were very keen to help other people from a shoulder to shoulder perspective, mate to mate, to be able to support them. So. We've got a, a very um, well set out sort of mentoring pro program where they develop their skills as being participants in the resilience building workshops. And then we do some coaching and group supervision with them and make sure that they're, they're very competent by the time they engage with a man that's, that's navigating 
his life's challenges. So, and can they um, be anyone? That, so people that would step forward and say that they want to become involved and they want to become involved specifically and help with the mentoring side of things, can they be from all walks of life? They don't have to have come from a counselling background or no, in, in fact, they get the, the training? Opposite, really? Yeah, yeah gotcha. a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the best folks, uh, you know, have had lived experiences, Karen, with, um, you know, issues like either mental health or custody issues or divorce or addictions or whatever. And in fact, so so uh, we've now got five sort of areas operating. And last week I linked um, a man that was struggling with one of our existing mentors and the existing mentor um, has had his own issues in the past with addiction and physical pain, you know, chronic on, ongoing pain. And so we could accurately match the, the men together, um, not only because they would get on well, but also because they had a sort of a deeper lived experience understanding of the issues the other guys were going through. So we, we have anybody from, you know, um, academics at, at university, we've got one or two, but we've got concreters, we've got plumbers, we've got builders, we've got um, jewellery makers, um, We've got um, managers of, um, of, of uh, stores, you know, all sorts of different occupations. But the, the main thing that links them all is a real willingness to give up some of their time on a weekly basis to go and kick a footy or have a surf or do something physical with a mentee and have an incidental chat, you know, a shoulder to shoulder chat about how they're progressing and how they're going so that they've got that consistent level of support um, in a social setting, um, as well as obviously being able to access clinical support if they need it. That's so interesting. It's really like completely rethinking the way that we tackle suicide prevention, isn't it? Because that to me sounds like the opposite of um, phone this number and a stranger at the other end of the line who knows nothing about you and um, can't relate to your life experience in the slightest is so, somehow going to talk you off the ledge, which I always find it's really condescending. It's not how real life works. Um, yeah. And, you know, as someone who has come out of addiction um, and had those personal kind of struggles themselves, there's a feeling that you get when you meet somebody else who's honest about that background. It's an instant connection and it instantly gives you a light bulb of hope that you don't get speaking to a stranger at the end of a phone. So it's a completely different way of looking at it, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. There's, there's a great place. Having spent 20 years on the phones as a crisis counsellor, I think they're, they're one, it's a wonderful service, particularly Lifeline, that I was involved in. And the reason I say that is because you're getting people anytime, 24 hours a day, where we can connect. But it's a bit hit or miss, and it's specific to I've hit a crisis, whereas what we're trying to do is to go back and find men in the community that are struggling with issues, but you know, men aren't very good with vulnerability. So making making it really easy for them to access mates and just good blokes that you know have a chat together, keep it real, really authentic, but also have a skilled background. You know, have yeah. some skills in terms of how to communicate. And you know, the one thing that we and I was with Adrian in in Bundaberg yesterday, or Eric or no, up there, who's a, a marvelous person, incredible human being, and. And we were doing a coaching and group supervision session with some of the aspiring mentors and existing mentors. And what we have to keep coming back to is don't problem solve, don't rescue, don't try and fix, just sit with it. And, you know, the, the things that we do well in marriages, if and when we do it, is to just to be there and listen well and to acknowledge and to sit with what's happening for the, the person but know that they're completely reliable, dependable. They're going to be there every week with them. And if you play soccer, I'll kick a soccer ball with you in the park. If you surf, we'll go out and have a surf. But we'll also have a conversation about how you're going and how, how you're really feeling about things. So yeah. the men have to be relatively well equipped with that, but at the same time, just really genuine, authentic folks that are doing it from their heart. You know, they're, yeah. there's, a, it's, there's one paid employee in the whole of Marcus Mission. We're all volunteers. So... You know, the, the key with this is having men that really want to give back to other men. But it's also the trick is getting a little gentle nudge from men in the community that are struggling with challenges from maybe uh, partners or sisters or mums or dads or whatever who say, you know, maybe you should go along to the resilience building workshops and, 
you know, develop some skills, but also maybe find a bloke that you can relate to that, you know, you'd be able to have a chat to on a regular basis. So now I hope you don't mind me asking this, but I did want to be um, quite specific with this question. Do you receive any government funding? No, none whatsoever, um, um, Corinne. We, uh, when we set it up, we were the major donors. So, you know, my wife and I um, decided we wanted to put a chunk of money in. But we, fortunately, I approached an old commercial client of mine, Wesley Mission Queensland, who are really innovative in this social support space. And yes. I said, look, I've got this concept. I know I've worked with you commercially, but I'd love to set up this. this. And they said, let's give it a go. So they immediately embraced it. They've got a, a guy who's got a master's in suicidology who was actually a participant in a leadership workshop that I did with them who is the program coordinator. But everything else is volunteer. It, um, and we put in a chunk of money regularly just to sort of kind of put our skin in the game as well, as well as spending probably about 50% of my time um, doing sort of running, facilitating workshops, coordinating the Sunshine Coast branch, et cetera. But, we do have uh, some initiatives. You know, we've got some, my, my sister, um, who's a mother of, of Marcus Mission, is incredibly active in fundraising. We have a Trek to Connect um, um, sort of walking marathon through Brisbane each year, which has raised, you know, significant amounts of money. Unfortunately, this year was the year where we couldn't do anything we, um, uh, with COVID. So we're sort of down a bit, but we, we run on a shoestring, really. Um, and um, we do provide, the great thing is we've got enough funds to cook up a brec breakfast for the blokes when they come in, give them some lunch, feed them well, as well as giving them, you know, um, obviously education at, at no cost. Um, but we rely on the goodwill of some amazing mentors in the five areas that we have, which is Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, Bundaberg, Lockyer Valley and, and Darling Downs. So, yeah, we, we, it's, um, it's pretty exciting. But at the same time, we don't have that luxury of having paid employees who can do some good administration work, etc. We bring in our social work students and our psych students who do some placements with us, which are incredibly helpful. But um, yeah, certainly that's that's one impediment. But at the same time, it's very freeing because we can do what we like, really, um, uh, under the governance structure, at least. Well, but yeah, that's a silver lining, isn't it? But have you tried to get funding and being knocked back or you haven't gone down that route? Well, well, we, we have. We've, we've applied for a few grants and we've got like we've got a few bits and pieces like with Lockyer and Darling Downs. So, you know, I think we got eight thousand dollars, which helps us to run a couple of workshops, which is really good. But um, generally with governments, you've got to have really good evaluation, and really good criteria. So we're. We've been working on that with our Sunshine Coast program and we've got a PhD student who's putting together um, a research project on the evaluation of the effectiveness of Marcus Mission. So once we've got that, I think we're in a better place. But to be quite frank, it's a really onerous thing to try and get funding. And um, what's really nice is that Wesley are putting their hand in the pocket. We're putting our hand in the pocket. Oni's doing some amazing work fundraising in Bundaberg. And when we get back to doing the marathon, we can get a bit of cash that way. And have you had much media interest? Yes, we, we, it, they've been great, the media. We've um, had a lot of local Sunshine Coast um, Daily and News and the Coolum News and so forth. In Bundaberg, they've been doing some good work, the local papers. And, and Brad um, Marcellus from the ABC in Bundaberg was doing a little summary of each of our workshops when we began in Bundaberg and putting that on the radio. And I've done a number of radio interviews. I've also done a lot of work during um, the men's um, health, mental health weeks of promoting Marcus Mission, but nothing, certainly nothing nationally. And to be honest, we're, we're pretty stretched in terms of the five areas we're operating in. So they're the kind of the key areas where we meet, need media. Um, we may, if people put up their hand and said, oh, it's a wonderful program, come to Sydney. Well, we... <laughs> We'd say, look, you know, until we can get some people on the ground, until we can get some people that do want to do some of the volunteer roles, we don't have that capacity. So, yeah, we, we've yeah. certainly got some good interest. Um, let me just ask you, ask you this. When you're talking about situational factors and, and life events that can contribute, you mentioned family law, uh, not a specific percentage, but roughly what kind of um, chunk of people, a chunk of men that you see would have had some involvement with the family law system, do you think? 
Yeah, certainly um, a fair percentage. I would imagine at least a quarter of men have had some some exposure to it and, and have found it pretty tough navigating it. But, but I think almost all of us have had practice marriages in the past. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we've had that experience of that sort of loss, um, but not necessarily involving custody issues with kids, but certainly at least a quarter, I would suggest, of the fellas that I speak to um, are in that situation. So if there are people watching this who are concerned about um, male friends or male relatives, or maybe they're watching someone go through a relationship breakdown or struggling with custody issues, where can they find you and how can they reach out for that kind of initial support? Yeah, it's a, a good question. Thank you. A um, couple of things I would say. If you're a family member or a friend or whatever and you're seeing someone struggling, the most important thing is to have an authentic conversation. That's one thing that was really important when I was doing the crisis counselling work is to go, you know, often people when experiencing these situations um, may have suicide ideation. May I ask you, have you had those thoughts yourself? so that we can get them some clinical support if they're at that really pointy end, but also to encourage them to engage in programs like Marcus Mission. I mean, we're running workshops via Zoom um, each month because we ran sort of 30 workshops during COVID and they're really popular um, via Zoom and men could engage without having to be in a room with others. Like they were in a virtual room. So certainly if they just Google Marcus Mission, um, they'll come up with uh, a page under the Wesley Mission Queensland page and they'll see, um, they'll see um, all of the workshops advertised there. But also, if people want to volunteer as a mentor, they can get involved as well. But it doesn't matter where they live in Australia, they can get some, at least some assistance with building resilience via those uh, resilience building workshops on Zoom a couple of times a month. John Morgan, thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate your time. I'll have you back on soon. Thank you. That was John Morgan, another good human who's doing incredibly good work, unfunded by the government and the suicide prevention industry, which I'll have more to say about very soon. Now, I was contacted by Scott Healy, who's written a book called Perceptions and Perspectives, which draws on his personal experience of depression. Let's have a listen to our chat. So I'm just about to interview Scott Healy, who messaged me on my Facebook page some time ago. Um, and I'll, I'll get stuck into what he said and a book that he's written about basically lived experience um, of depression. But there's actually a lot more that I want to talk to him about, too. I, what I'm really interested in is having honest conversations about mental health. Um, from people that have lived it rather than from the mouths of medics um, and people that tell us what we're supposed to think and feel, from people who've actually done the daily battle, done the, the hard struggle. So when you wrote to me, you began your message. I'm one of the lucky ones who survived 23 years of suicidal depression. It's now been six years without wanting to kill myself I've been able to listen, look people in the eyes and tell them that I truly understand. How are you doing? And tell me a little bit about your personal battle. Well, now I'm doing really well. Uh, luckily for me, antidepressants worked. And I know I am one of the lucky ones because there are so many people who try so many different pills and so many different antidepressants. And I've been, I've, I've walked that road and Unfortunately, sometimes you have to go through them to see what works for you. But within three days of taking the antidepressant that I take, I something that would normally trigger me off didn't trigger me off. And I went, why would I kill myself? I thought, oh, my God, this tablet works. Now, some people talk about them being placebos and stuff like that. No, definitely not. No way. Now, I don't like having to take a tablet. But if it stops me wanting to kill myself all day, then so be it. I'll take it until the day I die if they keep manufacturing it because I'm, I've never been happier in all my life. Nervous, but I've never been yeah. happier. <laughs> Nerves is good. We are alive and kicking. And, you know, I've, I've written about antidepressants several times um, as well as my kind of mental health battles and some of the darker struggles. I know that some people are really critical and, uh, well, hypercritical, actually, and actually quite abusive if you 
if you say that you're um, taking antidepressants or medication. But personally, I would say that they've saved my life. So it's up to us who have lived it and fought the battle, I think, to be really honest and open about those struggles. <coughs> because basically it sounds like they've, um, they've worked wonders for both of us. Yes. Um, as we've spoken about before, it's... <sighs> If it works for you, why not take it? I don't see why not. Um, I, I had some tablets that made, I could have nine, 10 hours sleep at night and be yawning all the rest of the day. Um, I had to I had to go through it, I had to try. Um, if you don't try, then you're just sitting in a battle with your mind all day, every day. Tell me about, you. in your book, you write, during the reading of this book, there will be some writings about the dark times I went through quite a few years ago. And you say, the dark times are what made me who I am today. What do you mean by that? Um, they taught me to be stronger. They taught me to listen to myself more. Yes. Um, I, the dark times were every day. Even going to work, working with the thought of kill yourself in the back of your head. What's the point of all of this? Why am I here? Um, the, the dark times were pretty much every day, Corin. Yeah. And it was a really long struggle. You say 23 mm. years of suicidal depression. Tell me about some of those dark times. Tell me about some of the real lows, like when you were really crashing. I'll share some of my experience too. So sure. We'll this together. Um, locking myself away for days on end, going out to the shops, grabbing what I needed to grab, beer, food, whatever I needed, just so I could go home and lock the door and pretend I never went out, just listen to music, do my own thing. Um, yeah. Luckily, because I'm a bit of a loner, I'm quite happy in my own little world. But there are times that you want to go out, you, you want to socialise, but you don't want to. And yeah. you almost make excuses not to have to go out. Um, being around groups of large people and being that black sheep, the outcast, the one who says the weird things, the one who says things that is sometimes just different than what other people talk about. Um, that's the best I can say. I Yeah. You mentioned their alcohol. Can we talk about I've been obviously very honest about my personal battle and struggles with that. I would say... Um, although I don't drink anymore, I made the decision that I had to stop and I had to stop entirely. That was my choice. That was my personal responsibility to, to kind of reorganise my life and save my life there. So although that was my decision and I took responsibility for myself, that was my personal choice. But I'm never preachy about it. And I understand yeah. that well, probably actually more than a vast majority of people, I very much understand that alcohol can seem like our best friend at times and it can seem like a coping mechanism. I'm interested to hear from you how much you leaned on it um, at some of your really darkest times. Massively. It was it was pretty much all that got me through. And then you wake up the next day and you do it all over again. I was still working. I was going to work, doing what I had to do. Um, some days I would go to work late. There was one of the worst times was when I was working in a club as a duty manager down in Sydney and I rang up because I was still so hung over that I, there's no way I could have driven a car. I had to sit in front of a manager and explain and apologise and, yeah, it, it can drag you down. But yeah. at the time, it feels like the best coping mechanism. Um, I still drink beer. I still sometimes drink too much. But... I make sure I do the things that I have to do every day. And that's yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's the really important point that I would like to make about living with depression. Even if you find a medication that works for you and you're an, on antidepressants and you it's all it's all a journey and it's all a it's day to day. And I know I sound very AA when I talk about one day at a time, sure. but it, there's lots of similar philosophies that actually are really relevant when we're talking about living long term with depression you literally drag yourself through one day at a time you have That's to tell yourself perfectly that said it is literally one day at a time that yeah. is it without um i don't know how to explain it as you said it is one day at a time 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now let me bring the um, tone up a little bit. Your book, Perceptions and Perspectives, which I loved, I found it like reading Chicken Soup for the Soul, where you end up with post-it notes on every page because there's so much that resonates with you. It was very obvious to me that it was that it had come from the heart and it had come from someone who's lived a very similar, some very similar life experience to um, to me. Tell me, the, the actual book, so it, it came from notes in your mobile phone, is that right? Yeah, because I'm a loner and I do my own thing, I'd sit there and just a line would come into my head. Um, one of my writings called You, about the girl I haven't met yet. She might be out there somewhere. But... Um, <laughs> It, it stuck. I was listening to music, drinking beer, and this line came into my head. Only when I stopped searching for you did I find you. Put my headphones on, picked up my phone, and just typed away. Yeah. I also really liked what you have to say about equality. You and I both, and we've had this conversation, you know, we both talk about equality of compassion. The world would be such a better place if it was a little bit more gentler and if people embraced that, wouldn't it? Be kind to others, but be kinder to yourself. Um, if someone was to ask me what the whole book entailed, that's pretty much it. It does go through my thoughts with depression and things that where I was doubting myself, self-doubting, but most of the book I would say is positive. Um, yeah. I'm sure some people who read it will get emotional over it, um, but be kind to others, be kinder to yourself, because if you're not kind to yourself, you can't be kind to others, sort of like a double-edged sword. Absolutely right. And it's, you know, it's your raw honesty that I think I was drawn to, even from your very first message. I'm like, this is someone who really gets it. And, you know, talking of getting it, you know, the whole language around, I guess, people who have been on a bit of a mental health journey themselves, and maybe they've um, they've battled and, and lived and struggled with depression. They've maybe crashed and there's been some suicide attempts along the way and there's been psych wards and it's all been quite like stuff that you see in movies. The language then that you start to adopt when you start to, I guess, begin on, without sounding very Oprah Winfrey, when you start to <laughs> start down that kind of healing journey, um, you, you become like a sponge and you're just you're absorbing positivity and you're absorbing little quotes, little tiny little things that you can all add, all add to your armour. Um, but it can start to feel like a bit of a different language, can't it? You talk about being an empath. How would you, what, how would you describe that? How would you sum that up? In okay. real, beginner's terms. Well, after you asked me that question um, the other day, I had to sit there and think for a while. It's not something that's easy to explain. So in the most basic terms that I came up with, and I asked a few friends' opinions, an innate sensitivity towards others, someone who has a powerfully overwhelming feeling to want to help people. Yes. That's the best I can do. And I actually think, I know that there's, this is quite cheesy and there's quotes around this, but the people who have been most broken and who have really, really battled and really fought in the mental health war and come through, those are the fighters that actually, I think, can end up being the most empathetic because they get it. They understand other people's struggles. And you don't want others to go through the same pain that you've been through. You try your best to to let people... I, I owned a taxi here in Harvey Bay for about 10 years, and sometimes I was not the nicest person. I was a bit snappy because it's not really what I wanted to do. What I'm doing right now is what I wanted to do. And there are times when I was able to just look people in the eyes and say, I truly understand how you feel. And they would just break down. Mm. Um, all they want, all someone with depression really wants to hear is I understand. I truly understand because you sit in front of a psychologist who has read a thousand books, but unless you've been through the pain in your mind, you you can't truly understand how somebody else feels. You can read as many books as you want. But Absolutely, yeah. The same it's, it's, as addiction. It's the same yeah. as addiction. When, yeah. when people tell me that they don't understand depression, I'm actually happy because <laughs> I don't want people to understand it. I don't yeah. want people to go through it, but yes. 
whatever it is that causes it, I'm pretty sure it's just a chemical imbalance in the brain. Mm. And as you and I both know, if you take the right medication, it can fix that chemical imbalance. Yeah. But I'm not telling the people to go out and shove pills down their throat. Go and find a professional who can help you. And I think also the, the really important point about that, it's like finding anything in life that works for you. It's a very individual thing, isn't it? Finding the right GP. Yes. You, if you put the time and energy in, you can find someone that really gets you and you can really click with them and they can really understand you and, you know, all the things that are going on for you and it can be really helpful. And it's a bit the same when you uh, when you start looking around for a therapist or a counsellor or a psychotherapist, whichever which ever direction you're going to go in, you're not always going to click with the first one. Sometimes I've had millions, and you know you 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 have to keep going until you find someone that actually you do have that connection with. But let me ask you another thing. I wanted to ask you in your book you write, "Without your self esteem, you're a slave to others' judgment." What do you mean by that? Well, they sort of go hand in hand really if you're going to let other people judge you then your self-esteem is low you need to find a way even if it means reading self-help books I've got nothing against self-help books um I haven't read them myself I just go through my own life experiences but if you are letting other people judge you and that affects you then your self-esteem is low you need to find a way to get your self-esteem higher so because that person judging you five minutes later has forgotten all about you. They're off judging somebody else. Yes. Don't let people's judgment get to you because most of, most of the time they don't care. They're not happy within themselves. So That's they have exactly to sit there and judge. Exactly right. And also let me read another quote from your book. You say, the more seeds that are planted by our minds by others, even if they are poisonous, will only grow as much as we allow them to. I really love this because I often talk about planting seeds in terms of addiction. You know, when I get letters from people concerned about a loved one's drinking or substance abuse, I always say, you can't control when they decide enough is enough. Exactly. But you can keep planting seeds in the meantime. And that is the bit that we can all keep trying. We could plant, keep planting those seeds. But see, there's the flip side to that as well. If people keep telling you you're useless, you're worthless, you are nothing, you're this, you're that, if those seeds keep getting planted into your head, then you're going to start to believe it. Um, if people are being negative towards you all the time and you let those seeds grow in your mind, then you're going to be negative towards yourself. I've been called many different names in my lifetime, but water off a duck's back, sticks and stones, eh? <laughs> love that I also really love this quote no matter how far or how fast you run you can never run away from your mind and this mm. really obviously speaks to me because I was the queen of running you know I Thank ran you. not <laughs> from, the queen king <laughs> <laughs> from England to New York to Sydney I ran and ran and did as they call it in therapy a geographic mm. after geographic but yep. my mind my issues my trauma and the causes of my depression Obviously, they all came with me. You would be the same, I would imagine. When I was 25, I travelled over to England. I had to get away. Um, and it did help, but this was still there. And yes. that was where I sat on a three-storey ledge in London in a pub that I was working in. I don't know how I got back in through the window, but I woke up the next morning and it was probably about an hour or so later after I woke up and it hit me like a ton of bricks that I was sitting out on the three-storey ledge, rocking back and forth, waiting to fall. That, I think I say in the book something about, it is something I will never forget but always remember. Yeah. That's sorry, so it is something I, sorry, it is something I will forget but always remember. Yes. I mean. mm. Yes. And I've that's forgotten about it. That's, that's gone, but it's yeah. still there. Mm. Yeah. So and tell me, for people that are listening to your story and they'll be they'll be identifying with bits of but something that you're saying, tell me what you hoped to achieve by writing the book and what is the, kind of like the key takeaway message for you, just to finish up. I hope that people who are struggling or if they know somebody who is struggling, then buy the book for them, get them to have a read of it. Um, 
be kind to others, be kinder to yourself. Um, I had a girl in Germany wrote to me and she said, for the first time in a long time, I'm not going to cry myself to sleep tonight because you helped me understand myself. Wow, isn't that? See, that makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? Uh, oh, I cried my eyes out. <laughs> what other feedback have you had, Scott? Can you give me another example just before we go? A uh, lady in England wrote to me and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is so nice to know that we are not alone in our thoughts. I will read this book many, many times. And that's actually the takeaway that I would say at the end of it. It's the kind of book that you have around and when you're feeling as we all do. And, you know, I think that this is the thing that people need to understand about living long term with depression. You're never quite sure when it's going to knock at the door again. And exactly. You need to have your toolkit ready. You have a survival plan and you don't wait until you're crashing and you're in an absolute crisis. Mm -hmm. You you know what tools you need to reach for and if that's reassurance if that's um, checking in with your regular therapist or reading some books that you know that can kind of pull some strings and resonate with you and put you put you mentally back on track again it's the kind of book that you have around um, and read over and over and over again well I hope people do I hope they keep it on their bedside table um, start off with the ebook and see if it's something that resonates with you and if you if you feel that it's something, then grab the hard hard copy and keep it next to your bed, coffee table. Let other people read it. Let other people find it. Yes. Um, all I say at the end of the about the author in the book, all I ask from the universe, my words find the people who need them. Well said and well done. Well done on being such an absolutely courageous fighter. I'm proud of you. And thank Can I hold you. My book up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. Ta-da! Lovely. Uh, and thank you for contacting me. Thank you for being brave and honest and reaching out with such authenticity. If I can help a few people stop themselves from killing themselves, that that's enough for me. Bless you. Thank you so much, Scott. Take good care. Thank you, Corin. Before I go, I just want to highlight a couple of news stories which have grabbed my attention this week. Look at this awful story about a Sydney woman who was charged with murder after a 35-year-old man's body was found at a St Mary's home. Channel 7 says a Sydney woman has been charged with murder following an alleged domestic violence incident in the city's west. Now look at how the ABC, our national broadcaster, chose to report on this same story. A woman who allegedly killed her boyfriend with an axe inside their townhouse in Western Sydney had been assaulted by him a year earlier. The ABC piece begins. Look at the key points just to the right there. The ABC understands Gio Sion was convicted of assault in Nea Maoli last year. So the murdered man had been convicted of assaulting his partner last year. She then decided to, allegedly, murder him. But look at the gender bias right there at the beginning. This man was watching a movie in the upstairs bedroom of the home. His body was found lying on his bed in what police have described as a horrific scene. Can we perhaps let this woman face the wrath of the law for choosing to murder this man with an ax? Can we perhaps not try to make excuses for her? Can we perhaps not try to build a narrative which justifies her violence? Can we, perhaps, not try to diminish the utter horror of her choosing to pick up an axe, climb the stairs and butcher him in his own bed? Let's also take a look at this article from The Age. The headline reads, COVID-19 recession is trapping women in violent households. It begins, frontline domestic violence specialists say the economic impacts of COVID-19 are disproportionately affecting victims trapping them in situations of abuse due to financial dependence, employment and a lack of affordable accommodation. It says a survey of specialists at 34 community services around New South Wales found rising rates of women experiencing domestic violence since the onset of the pandemic. Various experts are quoted and then it says a survey of 15,000 women in May found that 4.6% experienced physical or sexual violence from a partner or former cohabiting partner in the previous three months. Then an expert says, 
This crisis has disproportionately affected women. Workplaces and governments must not lose sight of the link between gender equality and preventing violence against women. Here we go again with the narrative around gender equality, which is basically a cover for securing special privileges. They only interviewed women, 15,000 of them. Their statistics are all taken from that sample of 15,000 women. How can you use a survey of 15,000 women and conclude that women have been especially affected? And the age and other media outlets just regurgitate these statistics. And so the hype continues, and so the funding keeps pouring in. There are no statistics taken from a sample of men because there are no services for men, because the whole entire industry is built on the myth that all men are abusers and women are innocent victims. That Duluth model caused so much destruction, it makes me sick. And I know it makes you sick too, because you, like me, see precisely what's going on. Don't worry, we'll keep shining a light on all this crap until people in power are forced to listen. Right, that's enough Barraclough for now. I need to lie down and maybe a chamomile tea. See you next week. The Corin Barraclough Show is a production of The Good Source, hosted by Corin Barraclough. To watch, listen to or read more new media without the social justice warrior narratives or politically correct fact filter, visit goodsource.news. That's good, S-A-U-C-E dot news. Become a Good Source supporter for exclusive access to live and unedited interview recordings, including the conversations before and after the show.